So today I'm chatting to, to Matt. I'm super excited to, to talk to you, Matt, for basically two fundamental reasons. One, um, really want to use you and your experience to get a, a little bit more of a behind the scenes view on what exactly is going on and happens and what the world looks like in terms of the ISB. Um, you know, since, since you work there. And the, the other side of our discussion, I'm really keen to provide students with a little bit more exposure to the idea of what a career in accounting education looks like. Um, I think for most of us, we think, oh, if I'm going to be in education, then I'm going to be teaching people how to do accounting. You know, I'm going to be teaching people debits and credits or whatever. Um, <clears throat> most students are fairly horrified at the fact that I teach people to do auditing. Understandable. Mm -hmm. Someone's got to do it. Yeah, I enjoy it. But what, you know, what is a career in accounting education outside of being a classroom? So there's kind of a twofold discussion um, that, you know, that, that I want to kind of have, have a chat with you. So thank you very, very much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Um, if you can give us a little bit of a summary of your career background and your qualification journey, because you're not South African. So most of, most of uh, my audience is South African and studying to, towards a South African yep. CA. So that is not you. You are not a South African CA. <laughs> so what are you? <laughs> what am I? Well, th <laughs> thanks for having me, uh, Yvonne. I'm really, really excited to be here and really, really happy to, to have this chat. So what am I? Well, <laughs> well, I'm, a, I'm an Australian CPA, uh, okay. so Certified Practicing Accountant. Um, in, in some ways, the journey for a, an Australian accountant is very similar to a South African accountant. Uh, it, it's, it's quite different um, here where I'm based now in the UK, where a lot of accountants don't come through university and get an yes. accounting degree. But in Australia, very similar to South okay. Africa, it's a requirement to have an accounting degree to become an accountant. Going right back, yeah, I... Um, I went to university uh, in South Australia, in Adelaide, uh, to become a biomedical engineer. I oh, uh, thought that's what I was going to do. And I, I did two years of engineering and, uh, oh, and okay. really just didn't enjoy it. I didn't, didn't oh. like what I was doing. I think the maths was just a bit too hard is probably the answer. <laughs> and and okay. I was okay at it. But, and yeah. and um, I was sort of trying to decide what I was going to do with my life and, and, and what, you know, what I could do. And I, I kind of started, you know, it's, it, it's nice at university. You can, you can find out what other people do. And mm. a few people were doing accounting and it kind of sounded interesting. And I spoke to the lecturers and they said, yeah, you know, the maths, it's, it's a little bit easier than engineering, but but you know, you still have to do some of it. And so I decided I'd give accounting a try. And, and for whatever reason, I found that I, I really loved it. So mm. I transferred from, from engineering to accounting. And so I did sort of a, an accounting uh, law, business law uh, oh, okay. double major, and uh, was able to sort of finish that in two years. So I was quite lucky. It didn't really slow me down uh, mm. too much. And, and I was was really enjoy well, I really enjoyed that and I uh, got a placement at uh, what was then Coopers and Lyre brand oh okay now price waterhouse coopers yeah. on pwc yeah. uh, but this was back when it was the big 6 um after <laughs> anderson was still in existence yeah. then and, and coopers and lyre brand and um i started that but but Sort of within about, and so I, I spent a couple of weeks at Deloitte's and, uh, uh, sorry, Coopers and Liabrand, and I, I really enjoyed that, but I was actually quite quickly given the opportunity to come back to university uh, and do an honours degree uh, in accounting. Um, and uh, so I decided to take that opportunity. I, I really enjoyed accounting, and so I thought I would do that. And, and in what is going to become a little bit of a theme of this discussion and, and that worries me at this stage, but, but, but bear with me. Um, I, I kind of got sidetracked while I was doing that <laughs> okay. honors degree. Yeah. And so I ended up, I was asked to do tutoring and very quickly oh. uh, I was running uh, first year lectures and things like that. Okay. So I actually was very fortunate to get what in Australia would have been called a, a level A lecturer position uh, okay. quite young and quite early. And, and yeah. so um, I got probably a little bit sidetracked and, and never mm. quite finished the honours uh, degree, but I enjoyed uh, working at, at the university and then actually got taken to or 
or uh, was offered a, a lecturing role at another university. So I, I went there and I was there for a couple of years. And then uh, I had the opportunity to travel to Malaysia. Uh, I had got married while I was at university and uh, my wife was Malaysian. She was studying in Australia and, and we thought it would be nice to uh, go back to Malaysia and, and work there. So I was working in Malaysia at at what were colleges that were teaching uh, Australian university degrees. And so students okay. would often stay for a couple of years mm -hmm. uh, in Malaysia and then they'd go to, to Australia. So I was lecturing there and, and spent about three years in Malaysia, which was fantastic. It was, was mm. awesome to experience a, a different culture and, and a different uh, working environment. Um, and then I had the chance to come back to uh, Australia again as a more senior lecturer. And so uh, I did that. And so really, um, and, and also at that time, got offered uh, a PhD uh, position oh, okay. as well. So I uh, uh, started doing a PhD and, and taking on sort of more senior uh, accounting uh, lecturing roles. And I was very lucky um, as uh, an academic, you know, you, you teach, which I love and have mm. always loved. And I was quite lucky to get some, some quite good academic papers while I was still uh, okay. uh, sort of quite young and and so as I said the story of my life I'd never finished the PhD I got off a few publications of, yeah. of papers and things and then yeah. got offered a chance to travel again this is often the life of an itinerant academic so I moved to Western Australia okay. um, as a senior lecturer and eventually ended up as the head of accounting at the University of Notre Dame uh, in, in Perth Australia okay. um, a bit of an unusual career path. It's unusual for someone to, to go where I did without a PhD and it would be very much more difficult now. It was difficult then. Yeah. Um, it would be almost impossible now. Like I say, I was lucky. I'd published, I'd done some research that had been quite popular and, and had mm. been quite, quite well received. So that kind of allowed me to bypass some of that. But it's, it's certainly, I mean, my first piece of advice <laughs> or, or comment is yeah. anyone who's interested in the academic field, but you know, yeah. serious academic field, you, you've got to get that, that PhD yeah, out of the way PhD, and, and yeah. get it out of the way while you're young and uh, don't have other yeah. things to worry about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so I was, I was head of school at the University of Notre Dame for, I think it was nearly seven years. And, and for the first five years, it was, was, was good. And I was, it, it was good for the whole time. But for the first five years, I was really focused on kind of uh, the school and teaching and researching. But I, I kind of got increasingly unhappy. I was really interested in IFRS, International mm. Accounting. And I was really mm. excited about teaching uh, accounting to students. And, and, you know, I think we did a very good, good job of that and you know I think that that passion and that focus we, we were producing excellent uh, graduates in in accounting yeah um, but I felt quite disconnected from what was happening in the real world of okay. accounting okay and, and so at some point I kind of uh, had the opportunity to talk to to BDO um, I'm sure mm -hmm. you have BDO in South Africa in fact I've met some of the BDO South yeah. Africa guys yeah. Um, and at that stage, the, the, the mining boom was happening in, in the world and, and mm. WA was doing very, very well. And, you know, uh, BDO in, in Australia, whilst it's a, what you might call a second tier, uh, accounting firm, um, for various reasons, it was actually one of the biggest auditors of miners. So okay. actually had a huge, um, audit book of these yeah. small cap, mid cap, uh, mining companies. And they were, as all these audit companies, firms do, they're bringing in lots of graduates. Mm. Um, perhaps some of the, the graduates they were bringing in, they weren't as happy with the, the, the technical skills they were bringing mm. over. Mm. And, and as I said, at Notre Dame, we had a very, very good reputation to, for producing very technically strong uh, accountants. So uh, sort of in conversation with them, they kind of offered me the opportunity to come and work for them half time. Um, and it was very ill-defined what I would do. It was kind of, well, figure it out for us and decide what you're doing. So in the end, uh, myself and another colleague who, who actually more from the audit side, but exactly the same story, had been in mm. academia, wanted mm. to do more. We went there. And so we were both sort of working half-time at the university, half-time at BDO. Okay. 
And at BDO, we were uh, spending some of that time training grads, which was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed mm. that. Really sort of saying, okay, remember everything you learned at university and you didn't think was really that relevant? You know, P this for degree or, thing, yeah. you know, that was last semester. I don't have to remember it anymore. Suddenly yeah. they had to remember it. Yeah. Um, and so we spent a bit of time working with them to just help them remember all those important things that, that we were trying to teach them that they actually need for their role. Um, and as part of that, also, we, we were doing some consulting. There's always an interesting tension between providing technical advice and yes. audits. And we, because yeah. we were independent from the audit team, we were able to provide okay. some technical support and also yeah. actually just training, which was outside of kind of technical specific mm -hmm. advice, but just training up, you know, people were hearing about the good training we were doing with, with these grads and they wanted their own, you know, junior accountants and no. commerce mm. trained up as well. So we ended up doing that and client training. So I kind of ended up for the last three years that I was kind of in Australia in this dual role where half the time I was uh, head of school lecturing, doing all the academic stuff. And then the other half of the week I was at a, an accounting firm still teaching, but, yeah. but also yeah, doing yeah. a whole range of other things. And it was a lot more interesting um with mm. that mix and and one of the big things was i was able to bring back real life examples yes, from bdo into the classroom, into the classroom. Yeah. yeah 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 so that's where i kind of ended up in australia and yeah. and and uh ended up kind of at, at that sort of phase of my career yeah then mm. how did you land up at the isb how does one go from an accountant to because the idea of of working at the ISB for me is, is just terrifying. I kind of have a feeling that you need to go in every morning and with your coffee quote, like paragraphs of <laughs> some standard. Like well, you, you guys stand around the water cooler joking about like paragraph three of an extra five to if we're 16 and how hilarious it is. <laughs> Sadly, I think that might not be far from the truth. There's certainly, <laughs> Certainly, there can be a lot of discussion about specific paragraphs and interpretations and, and wording. I mean, mm. we, we'll talk about that in a moment. But I think in terms of getting there, like any organization, they advertise. And, and I, I, someone, and, and for the life of me, I've been trying to remember who it was, sort of pointed out that the role of director of education had come up at the yeah. IASB. Right. And, and I think in some ways I was, if not uniquely qualified, certainly a rare breed mm. because they were looking for someone with academic experience, but also practical real world experience. Yeah. And the reality is the crossover between True. academia and practical kind of accounting. Rare. You specialize in one mm. or the other. Mm. And I guess this is one of the other things I think, you know, we, we could talk about today or another day is this, this difference between being a generalist and a specialist. And it probably does speak to the fact, as I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm not good at finishing things like honors and PhD and things like that. And it's because I'm a generalist. Yeah. I like thinking about lots of different things. I don't like the idea of learning on about one. one thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, in some ways, and I have to confess, I'd also kind of reached a point in my career where I was sort of half in, in academia and half in the profession and it was going to be hard to go forward in both and and mm. this role came up and it just seemed perfect you know they mm. wanted someone who had the mix of two experiences um you know a chance to come to london which was mm. was, was something that i'd never done and so i applied for the job and and uh I, i'm told many people applied and and mm -hmm. but, but the people who had kind of that mix of of the two academia mm. and and practice were, were fairly thin on the ground and in mm. conversations with the ISB, um, they decided that, that they'd like to offer me the position and it all happened quite quickly. It was in the space of a few months that I'd kind of resigned my role and, and then moved over to London. But what I would say, um, you know, keep an eye on the website. And this is true for anyone. There is a range of roles uh, that are available. They often do take what, what we would call interns yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, and I, I finished up working there about a year ago. Uh, at that time, uh, one of the key people in my team was a South African young grad who okay. um, had had worked in the profession for a couple of years. So she had also done tutoring um, okay. and lecturing, and and she had the opportunity to come over and and uh, has been working at the ISB. Yeah. They, they, they take quite a few, what they sort of call intern or secondees uh, mm. often come out of the profession for a, a shorter period of time. And when I say short period of time, two years, yeah. uh, 
with the ISB. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're, they're often advertising positions and there's information okay. about how to become a member. It's a bit of an unusual time at the moment, like many mm. places, because mm. you know hiring is difficult right mm. now, but that will pick up and there will be a pressure we'll to back. Yeah. bring people in. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, okay, so, so yeah. What, what, what does the Director of Education do? Yeah, so there, within the ISB, within the International Accounting Standards Board, there's kind of, the, the structure of the organization is that you have right at the center, at the heart of the organization, these 14 board members. And they mm. are the International Accounting Standards Board. And they're mm. drawn from all over the world. Um, you know, every, every corner of the world uh, needs to be represented. And they're yeah. people who have had distinguished careers. Um, the current member for Africa uh, is uh, Daryl Scott, a good friend of mine who came from South Africa, from Rand Bank, uh, and, and took on the role as a board member. And he's actually just in the place, in the process of being replaced by Bruce McKenzie from W Consulting and other South oh, Africa. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I know Bruce, yeah, okay. Yeah, and um, so that, that's one example, one of uh, yeah. you know, uh, the board members, but we have board members from Australia, from New Zealand, from Korea, from Japan, from China, from no. uh, Germany, from France, France, so you know, all over from the US and from Canada uh, and from South America. So 14, 14 board members, they sit right at the heart. Yeah. They're the people who make the decisions about yeah. and, and vote on on mm. what the accounting stands will look like. Supporting them kind of as the next layer is is what we call the staff uh, or the technical staff. And so, and I was a member of the technical staff uh, as director of education. Now, most most staff members are are more focused on supporting the role of the board members mm. in terms of developing standards, developing submissions, developing mm. proposals. It's almost in some ways like a government where those board members are the ministers and the technical staff right. are kind of the government civil servants whose yeah. whose role it is to really produce make stuff uh, happen the work and make things mm. happen and, and move the projects forward. Uh, my role as education, there was, this was, the, the role was very much created at a time when uh, there was massive adoption around the world of IFRS. Yes. And so the role traditionally had very much been about supporting implementation of IFRS in newly adopted countries. Mm. Now, over the three years I was there, that, that slowed down a lot then you know now there's 166 countries or so that that have adopted and use ifrs and, mm. and most of the others have made a decision about whether they will or won't so a lot of that work was kind of slowing down so in fact after i left there, there isn't now a director of education oh, okay. but the role yeah. at that point was very much about supporting the implementation around the world and, and really mm. looking for ways to help people understand what they need to about the accounting standards. Yeah. Okay. So you, you're not, you weren't involved in creating the standards themselves kind of thing. It's not initially by okay. the end. Uh, I did support, I was working on the IFRS for SMEs project. Okay. Uh, and often I'd be involved in discussions around standards, you know, just mm. for whatever reason that it, it is a, a lot like a university campus in some ways. It's very mm. collegiate. So there are often, even if you're not specifically on a project, there's often discussions about the project and, uh, you know, I, I was very fortunate to be able to participate in many discussions about many aspects of, of, of the accounting process. But within those sort of, within that technical team, and I, what I should say as well is I talked about the fact that you had these 14 mm. board members. There's only about 70 technical staff. It is a small group. It doesn't um, feel like, that doesn't feel right. <laughs> no, it, it, yeah. it's crazy. And yeah. it is a very small group that are producing these standards um, or, or working on this. And they're broken into project teams. So there's mm. about eight or nine what what were called directors who kind of take on board various projects and then under them there are senior managers who who run the the, the sort mm -hmm. of various projects uh, and then under those then there's uh, staff that are, are writing and researching and developing and and, and doing yeah. all those sorts of things so yeah. it is a very small team and it's it's really it's nice you can get everyone together in a room yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know regularly we would get together and talk about what the projects were you you'd have that opportunity to really understand what's happening yeah. yeah so how do you how do you get from a point of not having a standard for something yeah and then having having a standard like what creates 
the gap like uh and i, I mean you you know i'm like i'm not an equus junkie <laughs> like, i'm, I'm, I'm very sad like, to hear that you know my, my, you know richard is i've got one in the family so yeah, one of the starkies, enough. yeah one of the starkies is Ephraim. it's just it's, it's, it's ridiculous for the two of us to be we, yeah, we didn't want to compete with each other. We were bad on <laughs> You've anyway. got to have an auditor where you've got an accountant, exactly. don't you? Yeah, you've got to, like, you've got to check each other out. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so um, one of the things, for example, that uh, if I'm just thinking mm. you know, is, is popping up at the moment in terms of like, what do you do with that? Um, is let's say um, like cryptocurrency, for example. Great There's example. A lot of stuff of like, a great example. So what is it or isn't it? And in, in initial, you know, when you look yeah. at it, it's a little like, oh, it's kind of cash and bank. Um, so it just deal with it like cash, but okay, it's kind of not. Okay, it's a bit of a financial instrument. Okay, maybe it's not. Okay, so let's assume, I mean, oh, let's get rid of all the technical stuff because we don't want to go into that. How do we get to a point where someone would decide, yeah, we kind of need a standard to deal with cryptocurrency or not? How long does it take? How big an issue? Like, how do you decide? Yeah. Like, it's really, you know, how do you decide that a new standard would be needed? Yeah. Like, how do you get to that point? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. And so, obviously, we have a suite of about 41 standards right at the moment. Um, and the key point is, as, as everyone will know, I'm I'm sure we, we have the conceptual framework, which provides the basis for really how we account. Yeah. And in reality, those, the standards exist where things are more complicated and accountants need more support to apply the conceptual framework to come up with consistent, right. okay. uh, uh, you know, accurate okay. accounting. So if we, if, if I stop you there, cause obviously, yeah. you know, you've taught, I thought, Students don't actually really get what the conceptual framework. Fair enough. <laughs> and it's generally, in a lot of cases, it's generally taught as uh, today we're doing conceptual framework, tomorrow we're doing assets, you know, so it's very yeah. much, you know, and I had a, I had a bit of a similar ish kind of discussion with Bruce, like to some extent, but, but are you kind of saying then that if I was a good accountant and I knew my conceptual framework and I was yep. dealing with a transaction or I was dealing with an item that wasn't weird, yeah. You know, it wasn't like had it didn't yeah. have any funny stuff. Should I be able to figure out how to account for this thing by using nothing but the conceptual framework? That and the simple answer say. is yes, in theory. Clearly, okay, um, I'm not a good accountant. <laughs> look, there's, there's, there's two, let me put that. it another way. There's two schools of thought on that. Yes. I think, and, and maybe there's two kinds of accountants. There's, there's kind of good a one group of <laughs> one good and bad, one but. One there's two ways to come at everything. And in some ways, the US comes from the opposite direction of kind of what, what we call very rules-based. So the US, they like yeah. to kind of have very clear, specific, in this case, you account this it's way and, and that's the it's it's IFRS is very much principles-based. It, yeah. it comes from at it from a different direction. It basically says, look, these are the key principles for how you account. And that's what the conceptual framework is. It provides you with your yeah. groundwork. Yeah. And I think you're right. And certainly, you know, you asked me what my role of the director of education was. A lot of it was, was people would come and say, you know, where do the accounting standards how me, how, tell me how to account yeah. for X? Right. They're not necessarily meant to be a, a manual of accounting. Yes. Accounting is based on, on the principles that are, are in the conceptual framework. The conceptual framework gives us 90% of what we should have to know uh, how to account. And that's why actually some people, people come to me and say, well, you know, where does it tell me in, in here how mm. to account for transaction X? Yeah. And it doesn't because you know your asset, you know your liability, yeah. you know how you know to account. Element, yeah. yeah. So the standards are meant, and this is, you know, we may get onto this later on, but, but this is, the standards are actually hard. I mean, if people actually pick up the standards and read them, they look at it and go, this doesn't help tell me how to account. No, it's it not really a lot of, Look, No, it's, it's this not is one a of the things. I mean, I, you know, I, I lecture from the auditing standards. And yeah. I think that the auditing standards are written in English. Yeah. And you read a sentence and you read it and it says, you know, auditor's requirements. And it says, you know, the auditor needs to do this. I can go away from that and go, oh, okay, cool. I know what to do. When I read, you know, when I read an IFRS, when I read an accounting standard, I'm a little bit like, okay, so can somebody interpret that into like plain normal English? And <laughs> where's the debit and where's the credits? And why can't you just put journals in there, for goodness sake? Yeah. Like, you know, why can't you just put journals in there? 
look, and, and, and I hear what you're saying, and it is, you know, and these discussions were happening at the IFRS. I remember having discussions really? with okay. sort of guys who had been there for 20 years and so saying, some of them, and, and I won't, don't quote me on this, this is just between you and me, obviously. But, <laughs> and everyone you know, watches this. <laughs> but, but, you know, some of them would say, you know, in, in hindsight, if we could go back and do things differently, we may well have done it because it is sometimes difficult to pick up in a standard. But yeah. it's, it's, it's almost because a standard is dealing with the hard stuff. If it was easy, okay. you don't need the standard. That's what Excuse the conceptual yeah. framework's for. Right. Okay. And so the standards in a lot of ways deal with the exceptions or the mm. hard stuff and, and they jump straight in. So, and, and this is kind of a roundabout way of getting to where we are, you, or, or what we were talking about earlier yeah, on. Yeah. So, you, so cryptocurrency is a great example. If I even back up further, to, to sort of, the, the IFRS Foundation every five years, and in fact, they're just about to launch the, the process now, does what it calls an agenda consultation round. So, so it actually goes out and it says to people, okay, what are the issues that are emerging okay. out there where What's we need on? to yeah. focus our resources, our 70 staff yeah. to develop standards to support. And what they want to know is, is the problem pervasive and mm. is there diversity in practice? Now, cryptocurrencies, I think actually, well, it, it probably meets the second criteria. There's certainly diversity in practice, as you said. Is it is it just cash? Mm. Is it a intangible asset? Is mm. it is it inventory? What is mm. it? There's diversity in practice. But the big question is: it's, is it pervasive? Now we've heard a lot of talk about it. It's certainly exciting, and a lot of people talk about cryptocurrencies. But and I, I don't know the exact statistics. I don't mm. have them in front mm. of me. But the ISB to 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 look at this actually went out and surveyed companies and said. Do you have cryptocurrency and do What's you need this? to account for them? Yeah, is it and like I believe the number was like issue. less okay. than 1% held cryptocurrencies. Mm. And the majority of those, as I understand it, held them for one reason, to pay ransoms. They were actually buying them as insurance to, to use if they got hacked or, you know, the, or or, or for, really? for some reason. And yeah. it was basically saying, well, we think cryptocurrencies are probably going to get more expensive in the future. Why don't we just buy a few now and, and yeah. put them aside well, for if we need of, them later yeah. on? Now, that's obviously not every situation, no, no, no. But, but, but it's actually not a pervasive issue. Most but companies if it, aren't if going there. in five years' time, something shifts, whatever, and this becomes like a significant portion or becomes whatever percentage, yeah. then it would be something so okay so pervasive and kind of significant in terms of value and yeah popularity or, or stuff that's commonly going on as well as as you say people are it's going, diverse yeah. it's diverse people don't have we don't come to the same conclusions on it yeah and okay. so there's been some indication of that so that the, mm. the we we haven't spoken about and and you know i love talking about the interpretations committee which is you know where mm. actually a lot of these issues rise up the the interpretations committee was asked to look at cryptocurrencies and they can actually recommend that the board goes away and considers writing a standard okay. at this stage they haven't they've said they think given that it's not that pervasive it's not that common mm. you can account for it pretty okay with the accounting standards we have As they are. yeah but, but that's the process basically there's and, okay. and so you'll start off with an agenda setting process which is mm. identifying those key issues that people are finding difficult, uh, 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 need to be addressed. Mm. Then you'll go through what's called a research phase. There are staff who specialize in kind of going away and looking at what the issue is, what, what are the possible answers, is it even possible to write a standard that would deal with the issues people have? And that, that's mm. the research phase. That can take years. It can take one year, two years, three years, depending on the, the process. At the end of that, the board may decide to move it out of the research phase into the standard setting phase. And the standard mm. setting phase can take years. Um, mm. You know, so a, an average standard probably is five, six years in the in making, making if, right. it's, if it's easy. Insurance, the, the most recent yes, IFR 17, right, yeah. 20 years to, to create 20 that years. standard. 20 years. Um, wow. That's a bit you know, so it, it, it does depend on the issue and it depends mm. on a whole range of matters, but it is slow. And, and a lot of that is because they want to get it right. The, the IFRS Foundation doesn't want to, to, or the ISB doesn't want to be rushed into um, mm. you know, creating mm. an accounting standard that, that isn't going to stand the test of time. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's okay. kind of how they get, they, they get created.
That's that. That's quite interesting because it is. It is. It's quite obviously from this side. You just okay. Next year, I need to buy a new set of books. From a yep. student's perspective, it's just annoying because yep. like another big fat pile of books, most of which I don't actually know what is in them. <laughs> you like, mean you don't read these cover to cover every time? You know, <clears throat> they're really great for squashing crickets because they're very heavy. So <laughs> okay. So I had a maybe. tendency, yeah, I, I, I did. I used my big, especially Tex and, 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 and Everest, they were really big books. I used them to drop on crickets because I'm scared of crickets. They were very valuable from that perspective. The, the auditing standards, I think, are very valuable, very helpful. They make I think you might be showing some bias, but anyway. No, I think I'm, I think I'm being perfectly objective. I think that's great. So from, from, from your perspective, then, um, yeah. Which standards were you sort of involved in that you can look at and go, I, like, are there any paragraphs in there that you can look and go, I wrote that? No. Aww. No. It's, 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 it's far too much of a kind of a committee process and it goes through so many drafts and takes so long. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure there are people who, who can sort of say, I made a play to end. But, yeah. but, but it just, you know, by the time it goes through, um, discussion papers, exposure drafts, board meetings, um, it, 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 will, it will look very different. And, mm. it'll, it, it, and then it also goes through a whole editing process. There's a whole, whole kind of um, art to, to, to the kind of writing. And I know yeah. people find the writing frustrating and weird and archaic, but it is very... It, it, these are like legislation. Yes. Words have yes. to have specific yeah. meaning. Word, mean. You know, structures... Historically. Where the dash is and the colon and whether it's a semicolon and is that, yeah, that, that, that I understand. Uh, you know, I, the, I that. what's the difference between should and must? Where I used must, is that the same as where I used should? Will or must, yeah. Is Will, must, could, may. Uh, you, I'm quite serious. I mean, I oh, have I sat in on four hour discussions about whether the word should or must should be used in that circumstance. Um, so, I'm not sure and, and that's fun. <laughs> not every day. But yeah, it's can fun I have some it. more? Can I have some more coffee and biscuits? Thanks. Can we do this? So, if if um, completely trivia, if I had to give you an hour and say you have an hour to talk about your favorite standard, yeah. what would that standard be? I I think the most important and most underrated standard by miles is IAS eight, selection of accounting policies. Because that actually tells us what we um, should do as an accountant. Right. It tells us, and, and as a, when I was working in technical, which I loved, and someone would come to me with a new problem, it was IAS 8 that drove mm. how I would deal with that problem. So I really genuinely think IAS 8 is the most underappreciated standard. Fair enough. Okay. And, and the, one of the most interesting and I know it's probably not the answer you want because in some ways it's a kind of a procedural standard no but that's exactly the answer that I want because everybody's got everybody's got their little their thing for yeah. some well if it's not reason. ISA they're wrong though <laughs> and then and then there you have maybe potentially a little bit of bias but it's it's always interesting to um it's it's always interesting I, I remember when when Richard and I started working together many many years ago he was busy doing his masters you know Richard's did his master's in accounting, poor dude. And I remember him talking to me about how exciting fair value accounting was. Yeah, and I think I we're talking, it's not bad. Yeah, I mean, we're talking, I think we started working together when um, in about 2010, so around yeah. like 2010, yeah. 2011. And this whole thing, and he was like, and I remember killing myself laughing at him because he was just so serious about how like fair value accounting is going to change the world. And I, I mean, I'm really not that much of a techie. But I just, it was just hilarious to see how seriously he took it and just yeah. how, you know, it's going to like, and I'm like, when you, are you, are you talking, this is going to like feed the hungry <laughs> <laughs> great world peace. Um, I was, as you can see, I was tremendously respectful about. <laughs> as you should have. That's not should be. So, so Look, you, I mean, the reality is that so much of the accounting is, is set. We know how to account for it. Yeah. You know, we, we come across some interesting issues and there's always interesting issues, but but for me, it was really right at the cutting edge. So, you know, I remember in Australia, it was when we were starting to do um, carbon accounting and, and trying to do oh, okay. to deal with, yeah. with pollutants and things. And yeah. so a company would come to you and say, you know, we are, we are, we've bought land, we are going to grow 
trees to capture and store carbon and people can buy credits and and how do we account for the trees it's a really interesting issue because you know you we can't cut the trees down they have to be left in place so it's not agriculture because we're not producing we're not harvesting the tree you know is it property plant and equipment the word plant is in the title not that kind of plant I had to explain. Long story. Not- <laughs> yes, I'll bet it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, is it inventory? What is it? How do we account for it? And that's really interesting. It had real world application because, or real world implications yeah. because yeah. are we fair valuing the trees? Are we revaluing the trees? Mm. Are we, what are we doing? And, and, and what does it mean for the investors who are reading our financial statements? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, look, I mean, I think, think that's where the interesting stuff happens at that sort of intersection of what's new. And that's why I think cryptocurrency is a great example. Yeah. Uh, as well. Speaking of your your interest in stuff that's new, it kind of leads in. Can I share my screen your your new little website? Oh yes. So you've you've gone live with your new website. So I'm going to share the screen. I'm going to share two my days screen. ago. So we're brand oh, new. Oh really? Okay. Mm. So I will put the link into our discussion. Thank you. We can please ignore all the five million email tabs. <laughs> I always have more fun reading what this is the the new world we live in with uh, (laughs) meetings and things. It's always more fun to see what apps people have in their, their, uh, what's popping up in the background. Alrighty. So explain to me what's going on. What is your purpose and, um, what is Goth Geek? (laughs) Uh, that South African pronunciation, uh, Gap Geek for the rest of us, but But uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gap. Gap. Gap is (laughs) Okay. All right. My bad. Very South African. No, okay. it's, uh, that's, it's, that's it's a divide right. across the world. Look, it's, it's really uh, working with a number of uh, friends of mine. We've sort of really wanted a, a bit of a hub and a place where people could come together and uh, really sort of geek out on, on international accounting standards. Um, there's lots of great sources, lots of mm. great uh, material that's being produced, but you know, I've got a real passion for kind of reading and seeing what's going on, but yeah. a lot of my friends kind of, I'd, I'd find interesting articles and they'd say, but where did you find that? And it's, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a hub. It's a place where we can okay. bring together kind of interesting articles, discussions, questions yes. about accounting. And, and really we're trying to build a community of accountants, um, you know, and students as well who yeah, are interested in discussing your, accounting. This is so, this is that so is cool. Definitely very cool. Like a, a little accounting and auditing road trip. It's, it's amazing. Cool. It's, it's literally link? just been released today. Okay, and yes, yes, it's American and, and that, yeah, that's sort of there. there. But, you know, this was, this is good. It's, it's these three guys who are really sort of finding out where accountants go and what mm. it means to be an accountant. And I'm really actually excited about that video because I think every uh, potential and, and current accounting student should have a look at it because I think it really gives some great yeah. ideas. And it's stuff like that that I'm excited about. You yeah. can hear it. I, I, I want to be able to sort of share with people all of these kinds of exciting yeah. things that are happening. So we've um, got quite a bit of COVID, obviously. We've got COVID right at the moment. That's the big topic, the moment, right? Yeah. Um, so your pulse. Th- these are that's where we're trying to bring those interesting articles together. So the pulse is just kind of the heartbeat of what's happening in accounting at the moment. So you can see, and we're trying to draw from all over the world. You can see an article there from from Kenya and South Africa appears quite often, yeah. as does the UK. And you know, IFRS is international. I think. Mm. So many of these communities and so many of the professional Mm. bodies, which provide great advice, but they're so siloed Mm. into their own countries. And I think it's exciting to read about what's happening in Africa or in Europe or in Australia. And I think we can learn a whole lot from there. So that was kind of the, 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 the pulse, the, the blogs that at the moment, that's, to be honest, sort of where I have a chance to do some writing about some interesting issues. So it's a bit more where I want to say a bit more, but yeah. we're, we're at the moment talking to board members and to various other people who would like to contribute to awesome. uh, those blogs. So yeah. This is a chance to have a bit more of a long form discussion about an interesting issue. Yeah. For those who are interested in, in what the IFRS does, uh, if you scroll up a little bit, hopefully it's there. Yeah, um, just the, the top oh, right the highlight. there. Highlight from the, which I know doesn't sound that exciting, but I, f- I find it really interesting. And uh, I've written about here what, what's happened at the latest meeting. But if you scroll to the bottom and you're interested, you can actually see the board meeting in process. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, oh, so we've got a little go. bit. Now, it's a bit unusual at the moment because of the yeah, situation we find cool. ourselves in. People are doing it over Zoom or, you know, yes. Meeting yeah. Connect. Yeah. But you can actually see a discussion happening about boilerplate discussion and the different oh, views from different board members. Yeah, that's really, that's a different, that's really, really interesting because that really is like, the, that's what I was kind of trying to get from this con a little bit of a behind the scene of mm. trying to picture how this works. So that's really, really, that is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and so that that's sort of a chase, and you know the 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 other stuff is from podcasts and talks by yeah. Hans and and Sue, who are okay, we'll put, senior we'll members put of that the board. Link in there. So, yeah. Um, okay, so a lot of this at the moment is is because this is, obviously is a new site. This is a lot of yours, but you're kind of looking to create communities where other people will submit, um, you know, collaborate, and other people will submit you know, articles and stuff going on yeah. um, and create, I think you've got the little sub community. Yeah, we haven't can... launched that quite yet, but we yeah. kind of, uh, you know, we could set up a, a, a an Africa or a South Africa sub community where people kind of think, well, we've got specific issues we'd be yeah. interested to discuss. We Within want to be part that, of a larger yeah. community, but there are times when it's more appropriate there. But, yeah. you know, the, the forums is probably the other area where we're hoping to kind of um, have a lot of the content. This is yes. an opportunity for people to post their, their questions and views yeah. and, and, and really have a discussion. You know, very new. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting tentatively for the first <laughs> post there. We're hoping that people studying IFRS will come. Yes. We're, we're not going to answer your assignment questions. Oh, but that's we're, so pissy. I there know. goes, there goes all your popularity. <laughs> I know, but really happy to have a discussion about a point that might help you with your assignment. Yeah, yeah. there's so much good stuff out mm. there, but mm. it is hard to find, and it's hard. You know, we're all time poor, so we're mm. trying to take on some of that load of really unearthing the interesting stuff, like that video. I mean, I don't, really I don't think many people outside the US are going to come across that. No, but it's I wouldn't. Have the found gem. That. Yeah, I'm very keen. I, yeah, I, I took I took a brief look at that. I was quite um, I was quite excited about that. I'm going to go and scratch around that one a little bit more as well. That's very very cool. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'll leave the link um, for this, uh, and you need to create a profile. For, you can have a look like, around without it, but, but yeah, to yeah. contribute to the forums and things, yeah. yeah. We, so we... I'll leave a link on um, on the article on this post and on the on the video so that people can can find that. And it's Gap Geek, everybody, not oh. Don't <laughs> don't show how, how South African you are. Frankly. No, no, you're you're welcome. We want all <laughs> accents. We want all views. And I I only tease you. One of one of the things I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, Perth is is sort of called little Cape Town over in Australia. I mean, it was, I worked, I think yeah. half the population were from okay. South Africa. I worked with a lot of yeah. South Africans. It's, and it's I, the immigration love... corridor of South Africa. They kind of go, you, you, you get born, you, you're born in Johannesburg, which is where all the money is. Yep. Yeah. That's where everything's happening. And then right. when you move to Cape Town, everybody's like, you've got one foot out the country already. That's right. like the corridor. <laughs> like, wherever you are, Durban, Joburg, whatever. Once you're in Cape Town, it's like, yep, it's only a matter of time before you. So yeah, it's for, Immigration and one thing I will say to your, you know, to, to your students and to those listening, South African accountants have a fantastic reputation. South African Ooh, accountants are some sure. of the technically strongest accountants you can hope to work with, you know, and that is that is well known in Australia that, that the guys who come out of the South African accounting education system are really, really? good and what, really strong and, and be that? proud of that. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's awesome. Considering how much I've just told you how little I know about anything, that's pretty cool. Um, Look, I think it is a <laughs> strong grounding in good yeah. university programs. And right. part of that, I think, unlike Australia, where I've said we do have that strong university mm. perspective, maybe one difference, I think SICA is much more involved in accounting curriculums yes. uh, in, in South Africa. So you've got this yeah. very strong, consistent theme, mm. no matter where you study in, in that accounting curriculum. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my mm. understanding of... of, of yeah. You know, Psycho takes a really strong, strong very, yeah. hand in making yeah. sure that that foundation is very, very strong. And the Psycho, psycho qualification is, is a high quality uh, uh, qualification. And yeah. they're not paying me to say that. But, but it really Wouldn't does it be nice carry if they were? <laughs> yeah, look, Except and, we can and figure something out. A lot of, it, it is funny. A lot of the technical techie accountants in Australia come from that South Africa background. Yeah. They okay. come very strong with that. Yeah. It's important to also have your soft skills and important to also focus mm. on those other areas, uh, you know, understanding business and, and mm. making sure that you can work well with clients and things like that. It's, it's, it's equally as important, but 
be proud of and, and, mm. and, and, you know, really, really take pride in the fact that, that you are learning and, and recognized as being very strong mm. accountants. That's really, that's really good to hear. So it is yeah. really good to have someone externally who's, you know, who's dealt with, a whole, you know, a whole bunch of accountants, you know, that is, it is a really strong program, uh, you know, yeah. in all the traveling and all the ex- experience that I have, it's, it's the same thing. Yes. Um, the, the profession lays down the academic background, you know, lays down the academic competencies and the universities have to speak to that. You know, they will only be accredited to run a psycho, you know, a psycho degree or they'll only be accredited to run that degree if they meet those competencies. So it's, you know, you either, you know, either you're accredited by the professional or you're not. And that's, yeah. you know, that's, so it's very, very, very well put together. Um, it does mean the pass rates are horrendous because it is really hard. Um, one of the things, so from, you know, from accounting education, what mm. does accounting education mean? So, you know, there's the teaching p- people how to, you know, how to use, do, implement, work with, blah, 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 and actually do the journals for yep. all the stuff that's already there. But when you're researching accounting stuff, what does accounting education look like? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's as diverse as accountants are. And, and you know, it, it, it ranges from, you know, focusing in on what's new in accounting. And, and we, we haven't really spoken a lot about mm. the, the interpretations committee. But, you yeah. know, there's a lot of what's new in accounting is happening with the questions that are going to the interpretations committee and their agenda decisions. So a big part of my role now is, is, is running sessions to keep accountants up to date on on the latest developments in accounting that can be a, a new standards they're they're mm. rarer obviously mm. ifrs 16 was really the last big standard we had around leases an important standard but really mm. an evolutionary standard mm. um ifrs 15 was the last major change ifrs mm. 17 lease uh, uh, insurance isn't really that relevant to the majority of mm. accountants mm. the next one ifrs 18 probably will be if it's the new uh, disclosure type stand, uh, standard. And that will mean a lot of talking to accountants, getting them up to speed. Mm. But, but a lot of it is actually more micro than that. It's, it's where are accountants getting things wrong? What, is, what are the new interpretations? What is the, the new trends? You know, right now, COVID and a post-balance date events, an issue we haven't really thought a lot about for a while, post-balance yeah. date events, they yeah. really that interesting. Suddenly they're interesting. So a lot of the training is, is working with accountants who are really smart, really engaged in, in commerce or in various areas, but who, you know, again, need to be kept up to date with what's happening. Mm. A lot of the other training is working with people who are who who interact with accounting and need to know more about accounting. I really enjoy working with directors of companies and and talking to them about the things they need to know about reading financial statements and and in their own sort mm. of companies what should they be worried about when they're looking at a set of financial statements because after all at the end of the day it's the company directors who sign the financial statements, not the accountant. That's right. And yeah. so making sure they know the questions to ask the accountant to make sure that the information is right and that the, there's nothing there that they need to worry about. So, you know, working with lawyers who have to read financial statements, um, working with investors who want to, to, to get better information. So, you know, accounting, it's very easy to get caught up on the process side. And, mm. and I obviously find the process side mm. interesting. But as accountants, we always have to remember we do this for a reason. The purpose of accounting is to yeah. allow the users to make decisions about the allocation of their scarce resources. Mm. Should be burned on your brain. And and that's our job. We've got to be providing useful information, communicating it, right. making sure it fulfills that purpose. And so a lot of the training is is allowing people to unlock you know the, right. that information in the financial stuff. Right. So dealing dealing with with people who are obviously like you say, you know, lawyers, directors, professionals, mm. whatever, highly qualified. Uh, what, what would you say? I know it's a bit of an off, off, the, off, off the top of your head question, but what would you say the biggest m- common misconception about accounting is or about if it actually is? Like, well, I think, I think it's easy to fall into that bean counter bookkeeper kind of yeah. perception of what yeah. is an accountant and accountants are so much more, um, and, you know, and, and, maybe it depends on the country. I mean, again, I, I don't know the statistics in 
in South Africa, but in Australia, over 50% of CEOs trained as accountants. Yeah. And, and that similar, represents yeah. the reality that an accountant yeah. is so much more than just the books. They're about understanding the business. Yeah. But I think, I think what I struggle with or what, whether accounting is really just about compliance, you know, we produce mm. financial statements because we have to, and we lodge them and that's the end of it. Uh, yeah. But it's actually going beyond that and saying, no, there is useful information in here and there is there strong value. evidence. And, you know, you look at Warren Buffett, he says he reads the financial statements and that's where he gets the information he needs to make the good mm. investment decisions he's making. Mm. There is strong evidence that, that reading and understanding the financial statements gives you an informational advantage. And I, I think in many ways, that's the biggest misconception that the, the accounts are just a compliance document. Mm. They're right. not actually that useful. Not valuable. Yeah. I think it's, it's a very similar and yet trickier discussion when it comes to auditing. You know, you've got the financials. Okay. So now they have to be audited. Is it a tick box process that mm. you just have to do it? It's a grudge purchase because someone said so, or, yep. you know, does the auditor add actual value? You know, does the audit add actual value? So I think, I think it is interesting. And I, I agree with you. I think it's really worth um, for students to take a step back and go, you know, when I'm focusing and I'm losing myself in a, how on earth to account for, you know, for, for borrowing costs and, 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 and all these weird things, yeah. then, um, the ultimate goal at the end of the day is to provide information to users. That's it. Like that's, you know, can be yeah. as simple and as complicated, um, as simple as complicated that, but we forget, we forget that there's a purpose. We forget that there's accounting is a means to an end. Yeah. Accounting is not, you know, the, the end yeah. in itself. That's right. And it is easy to get folks that are all sort of lost in that. The other thing I'll say too, and sort of one of the things I saw as I, particularly once I went back to BDO and was doing things, I know auditing can, can kind of have a bit of a mixed reputation. Mm. One of the mm. things I would say to students watching this is that auditing provides a fantastic grounding in business. That yeah, was right. actually the thing I got most excited about in a lot of ways is working with young auditors who would go and audit a mineral sands company in the, on mm. the Namibian coast. And they would come back and they would know so much about that business. And it, yeah, it was yeah. really interesting talking to them about the business processes and the good auditors, the guys who, who didn't necessarily go on to become partners and they were, mm. they were so good. They were quickly snapped up and moved out, but the good auditors wanted to know about business, yeah. how it Curious. operated. Yeah. And they would link that back to the audit. They, they understood mm. the relationship between how the business operated, what it was doing and what yeah. they were auditing. And they, they took the time to understand business. And, and I think that's a real opportunity. And I would encourage you mm. to, to look at a career in auditing. I think mm. it is a fantastic grounding in business and to seize the opportunity to learn from your clients yeah. because it really is yeah. an amazing opportunity. I think uh, when, you know, um, you've, you've got to do your three year minimum, three year articles. Mm. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of students say to me, but Yvonne, I don't want to do audit articles because I don't want to be an auditor. Yeah. Understandable. That makes yeah. sense. You know, don't, so, but the reality for me, again, I lecture, you know, I lecture auditing is, is one of my specialisms, but I don't ever want to be an audit partner. <laughs> you know, I don't ever want to do, but the value of the thought process, yeah. you know, because teaching, you know, when you learn IFRS, for example, it doesn't teach you risk-based thinking. It doesn't teach you, you know, what non-financial information means. It doesn't go through processes, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas um, what I say to my students is auditing is a backstage pass. You know, as a first year audit yes. clerk, when you go on to any job, you have access to more information yeah. than possibly, you know, your senior accountant at the company does. Yeah. You, know, you have the ability to sit in meetings and, you know, ask questions and delve in and scratch into stuff that very few people in the company yeah. have access to or know or understand. And if you're curious, if you really yes. do approach it with like, not, oh, okay, oh, you know, I've got to add this up again kind of thing, but like, yeah. what's going on here and how does this work? And yeah. You know, right down to, yeah, we all are curious. I do want to go see the salaries. <laughs> I do want to go and see who's being paid what and how and why and like, um, you know, but it's, it's all about a curiosity of yeah. going like, what's really going on here? What if that happens and that happens and you look at that and, um, and you know, one of the auditing standards that my students struggle with so much, for example, is I say 520, which is your analytical review. Yeah. And students are like, 
I really don't know what that is. And it's so useful. And I'm last like, year you know, plus 10%, isn't it? Yeah, it's like whatever they did last year plus minus 10%, maybe with COVID minus 20%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I said, you know, you're like, you're great. We really entertaining. And I, I think I should try and set that up one day. Like a really, really good auditor can take a set of financial statements and from nothing other than yep. reading through that financial statements can tell you some fascinating stories yes. about what's going on in that company that yep. very few people would know. By doing nothing other than taking a set of financial statements, doing, you know, comparing, looking, movement, relationship, if that moved and that hasn't moved, that's weird. Because if that yep. moves, then that should move. And that hasn't, but if that's moved and that moved and that hasn't moved, okay, what does that mean? Let's look at yes. it. So it's, it's actually really amazing. It's like a magic trick, if you yeah, will. Yeah, no, 100%. If you don't understand that. The, and that, you know, that's not, auditing knowledge you know that's obviously the understanding of how business works what if this yeah. is how it's recorded and, and but it's it's a powerful skill yeah to, it's, it's almost forensic isn't it it's almost yeah. like that kind of police mentality it's sort of like it's, a magic it, trick if, you it will, is. if you're not quite sure how it works to have someone look and go oh i would be asking them about what's going on here because that doesn't look right how on earth yeah. did you like how on earth did you realize that where did you come up with that yeah um, and that, yeah, I mean, you can't tell me that's not a valuable skill to have, yeah. not to entertain people at parties because nobody cares. But, you know, in, in business, if you're running companies, if you're, you know, if you're the dude, if you're the, you know, the person, the, like that type yeah. of skill is incredibly valuable. And auditing teaches you that. Yeah, absolutely. It's that ability to focus in on what matters. And, and yeah. you know, I, I, I regret in some ways that I didn't stay on at, at uh, Coops and Library. I, I mean, I'm very happy with where I've ended up and what yeah. I've ended up doing, and I love it. But I think at the time, I didn't realize the opportunity that I, yeah. I had when I, yeah. I went there. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it, it's exactly that. It, it, it really is a great training ground. And so I, I agree. And I, mm -hmm. I've often spoken to students and said, you know, you might not be excited about audit. But just think of it as an extension of your education. Yeah. And it, it is one it of the, is. some of the best training grounds yeah. you can get. Yeah. In normal jobs, you would be working for five years at one company. Yes. And then maybe another five yep. or six years, which yeah. means in 10 years, you've had yeah. exposure to two companies, systems, management yep. styles, how stuff works. As an auditor, every three months, well, you know, yeah. depending on the size of the audit, you're yeah. behind the scenes in another organization, systems, processes, management. And then, you know, you literally, by the time after your three years is done, you've mm. got this list of what not to do when I run my own company. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I would also say that what you've just said is actually a really, again, I don't know the South African market so well, but certainly, you know, people in Australia, you know, young accountants, they'd be very focused on the big four. And the big four yes. provide a fantastic totally. training ground. Exactly the same here. Exactly the same. Well, not here in South Africa. Exactly. In, in South Africa, but 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 there is the risk at the big four that they do have the massive audits, and so you might yes. actually spend one yeah. whole year just working on one bank. I agree. And I have to say that that if you're if if you're disappointed, or in fact, some people I think now are choosing not to go to the big mm. four, but are looking at a second tier or even a third tier mm. firm. That's one of the exciting Even things there is that they, yeah. they often deal with smaller clients and you really will get rotated through many different perspectives. So don't yeah. be disappointed if, no, no, if you don't get an opportunity to yeah. go to one of the big four, because I think there is a lot to be said uh, and a lot of merit in, in some of the smaller, mm. smaller audit mm. firms as well. I am. Um, I was, I was one of those. I wanted to be, cause you don't know anything different either. No. If I want to be a good auditor, then I must go to the big four, you know? Yep. But I was a part-time student. I was a correspondence student and I had to work through all my studying and everything and nobody wanted me for me. Uh, and so Deloitte's PwC, NY, they were not, you know, I, I did not feature on their radar. They didn't even bother to answer my emails and my applications. So I was like, well, More for them, happen. obviously. Well, you know, <laughs> who knows what my future could have looked like. So I did go to, I went to a mid, I went to a um, medium, it's an yep. international firm. They're now part of BDO yep. um, in South Africa, but yep. the medium. And I was disappointed because my understanding was that my qualification would be less, you know, mm. my professional qualification would be worth less or less credible because I didn't have the right name behind mm. me. That, and that's well, what else are you supposed to know? You know, you, yeah. you know what else yeah. are you supposed to know? Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the, on average, the audits were 
you know, two months instead of yes. six months. Yes. Um, and the audits were, because the firm is smaller, the clients are different. I wasn't strained by industry. So yes. I, I had access to, you know, mining, retail, manufacture, blah, 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 all over the show. There was, you know, I wasn't stuck, not stuck, but I wasn't you know, zoned no. into one particular industry, yeah. different sizes, different ownership structures. And the really nice thing about, performing or, or being on audits, you know, that are smaller is that you see more of the process. So, yes. you know, if the job is that big, you can by default only look at that. So it's very difficult to see how, what you're doing, which is, you know, and you, you're focusing an enormous amount of detail in here, but it's really difficult to understand how that fits into the risk assessment yep. from the beginning and then, you know, into yep. the audit. But when your audit is only that size and you're working on that, it's a lot easier to be involved, you know, with a much greater portion of the audit. So yep. it was a lot easier for me to see how what I was doing today was impacted by the risk assessment and how it would impact the audit opinion, which, yeah. I, you know, I do. I know a lot of people who come out of, you know, big audits, um, you know, are potentially in their sort of second year of articles at, at big firms and are still not quite sure of the relationship between, the yeah. procedure, the risk, and the opinion. Yeah. And I'm a little bit like twitchy as a lecturer, but that's, you know, for another day. <laughs> so I totally agree with you. Yeah. And I think if you're planning on being an entrepreneur or you're planning yeah. on managing a business, then a medium-sized firm is possibly better for you yeah. because you're going to be spending your time talking to financial managers who are going to be similar to you. You're yeah. going to be seeing what the business looks like, seeing the yeah. challenges, seeing the sizes, you know, if you're auditing banks and you want to be a financial manager at a retail company, you're not seeing the challenges. No. You're not seeing the characteristics. You're not seeing, you're dealing with, com you know, completely worlds apart kind of issues. Um, so I think it's, it's, I, I, in South Africa is exactly the same. There's a yeah. massive fear around the big four don't want me, therefore yeah. I'm not no. going to be a good CA. Um, and also that I won't be accepted internationally. So I, there, I did have a fear that because I wasn't at a big four, if I ever did move overseas or I wanted to, you know, that I wouldn't be accepted because yeah. nobody knew the firm that I was coming from or, or whatever. So I'm glad you mentioned that because it definitely is, um, I definitely have that fear from students. Yeah, no, and I do too. And that's why I kind of wanted to bring it up because I, I, I think I've seen so many students so disappointed that they mm. didn't get a big four role. And it's like, man. actually, <laughs> actually, you don't know what a blessing that, that, that may well turn yeah. out. And, you know, if sometimes things are meant to be and, yeah. and, and, you know, I've seen, and, and that thinking has shifted. Like I said, I think the second tier GT, BDO, mm. Mazars, mm. they have, an international reputation they're fantastic you know and you spoke about you know i absolutely agree you get that bigger view of the audit you're also that much closer to the partner and there's yeah. a lot of wisdom to be gained yeah, from being is. in the same room as as, yeah. a, as a partner so yeah, yeah no absolutely uh, I, I, I agree i think it's it's um wherever you are you take the value that you mm. want to take yes you, know, you may land up in a terrible situation because articles are not pleasant let's be honest no. you know Stuff no. is, you know, not ideal. Yeah. Um, but the reality is what you take away from it is what you decide to take away yeah. from it. So it may yeah. not be what you wanted, but you have the opportunity and you have the attitude to go, well, this sucks. Um, it's not what I wanted, but I'm going to make the best of it. And in, in my case, that's what I did. So Deloitte yeah. doesn't want me. I don't know what that means. Um, you know, it's clearly I'm not good enough, but this is it. This is where I am, but I'm going to make the most of and get the best out of and, you know, and, it would be stupid to sit there and go, oh, well, if that's the case, then I'm just going <laughs> to... And I think that builds off something else. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop sermonizing soon, but... Oh, no, I never but, stop sermonizing. This is what I do. <laughs> but I, I think something else I'd sort of say as well. I mean, we hear a lot about following your passion and, and, and doing what you're passionate about. And there's merit in that. But I, I actually, I think there's a counter view that's coming up at the moment. And I actually agree with it more, which says take your passion with you, do whatever you do with passionately and you will become passionate about it. And, and I think that's what I'm hearing from you as yeah. well. And I, I think yeah. it is a really important message. It, we can kind of get stuck on, I, I haven't found my passion or, you know, yeah. I'm, I, I'm passionate about going to the big four and I haven't got there. Yeah. Actually you take your passion with you yeah. and it doesn't matter if the job sucks, if you're passionate about it, you know, that someone will see that someone will recognize yeah. that and yeah. that next opportunity will open up. Yeah. Or you'll open up that, that's been, you know, for me, it's been a, a huge shift from being an employee at whatever level to working 
for myself, the mm. idea of create, you know, creating your own opportunities. Yes. Um, is, is 100% attitude based. Yes. You know, if you have the impression that if this doesn't happen, then nothing's going to work out. And so yeah. they form stuff now and nobody, you know, uh, then you're in trouble. But yeah. as you say, if you take that passion with you and you take the determination, you take the, um, you need to go out there and look for the, the opportunities. Yeah. Look yeah and you're opportunities. open to the opportunities. Yeah. yeah and, be, and be open to them. Um, and I think it's very easy to sit back and go, okay, I'm, you know, and I think it's being a professional in a way is safe because yeah. I've got, I've got the career, I've got the qualification, I've got the piece of paper that says I'm okay. So therefore somebody must employ me, but that's a starting point. Yeah. You know, that's, that's really in three years time, you're not really doing anything that that piece of paper was based on anymore. No. Quite honestly, like most of us are not actually really doing what we were qualified to do. <laughs> if you no. think about it, you know, no. So you, you can't imagine that that's going to be, sorry for all you guys out there that think that you qualify and then it's all going to be easy. It opens the door and it, 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 it makes the journey <laughs> possible, but that's right. Yeah. Spoiler alert, it's going to get a lot harder once you qualified. Sorry. But more exciting too. More, more, more exciting. And, and, and I think from, from what I like about your journey as well is that it wasn't, you know, it's, your journey as well. It's not like a nice clean. So I decided that I was going to do this, 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 and this, yep. and then that's yep. what I did. And that's how I got there. And so yep. it all went according to plan. It was a little bit, maybe yes, no, now that I'm exposed to it, and that didn't yep. work out, did work out opportunity. Da, da, da. And I think that's really important because so many of my students have the idea of, I had a plan, the plan's not working out. This means that it's all going to fall apart. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we could do a whole other talk about that. I'd be happy to come and talk to you about we, that. We, I think. We, we probably will. We probably should. Because I think yeah. it's, 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 a prob it is a, it's a global issue. It if the plan is. doesn't work out, if I failed, if I've done this, if I've had to stop because I have a family or whatever the case is, what does that mean? Does it mean that I'm too old? I have people all the time emailing me going, Yvonne, I'm 29. Am I too old to qualify as a CA? Oh, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> Well, look, you're the one who's talking about Arthur Anderson like a little while ago, so let's not, let's yeah. not, let's not, say okay. but yeah, um, you know, it's like, yeah, any, no, I absolutely agree, yeah. and, and yet, but, and I think, you know, and I don't think it is too late, and, no, and, 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 so, yeah. and you know that, but you know, you know, we, we all know people who go off and train to be doctors in their 40s and accountants, and, yeah. and some of the best, you know, some of the best students I've had were doing accounting in their 40s and have gone yeah. on to do very, very Maybe well things. because they've brought a whole lot of other experience yeah. with them. I absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I'm, 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 I'm really glad. And one, it's, it's really nice to hear similar practical like realities um, from someone with your profile. And, you know, like it's, it's hard when you, I think when you're so separated from how stuff works, it's like people who work at the ISB are like the gods of accounting. <laughs> you know, you've got to like, the dudes who said it was a debit, you know, you're the guys who said thou shalt debit assets kind of thing. What do they say? Never meet your heroes. You'll always like, be disappointed. <laughs> you'll be somewhat disappointed. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's like this, this is practical stuff. This is, this is, you know, the reality. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Well, it's, it's been a real pleasure to, to chat with you today and, and you. talk I about some of this it. stuff yeah. and, you know, um, I certainly, yeah, always happy to have a chat. Thank you. Yeah, we will um, generally, like, if students want to leave comments about stuff that we can chat about. Yep. Um, again, I will leave the link for, for the Gap Geek uh, so that students can... I feel so bad now. I wish I hadn't <laughs> said anything. <laughs> for the rest of however long we ever work together, I'm never <laughs> going to let you forget that. Um, <laughs> at least I can spell we, it correctly. I have to say, we even used to tease our South African board member about when he would talk about GARP and we would, or he would get teased at the board table. Oh, well then at least I'm in good company. I'm fine. With it. That's okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank and he you would make the same that. argument as you, that it's a double A. It's a double anyhow. A! <laughs> double A, come on. But hey, whatever you want to get it wrong, it's fine. I'll, I'll, I'm prepared to make these compromises. It's fine. I appreciate um, that. <laughs> yeah. So whatever comments come through, you know, students want to discuss certain stuff or want to know more about stuff, we can, you know, we can have another chat. I'd love um, to. Maybe set up some time for you to lecture us on exactly why IS8 is as exciting as it is. Always. That might be, that might be worth doing. Um, yeah. So thanks very much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, hopefully we, we shall chat again soon.
Thanks, Yvonne.